social distancing and all the rest. I appreciate your cooperation with masks and um, no touching, no hugs, handshakes, or high fives right now. But, uh, but that is not going to stop us from focusing on the Lord and inviting him into this place. Amen? Amen. Okay, we're Pentecostal, so let's just get one more yeah. shot. I'm really glad we're here today. We get to worship the Lord. Amen? Come on. Awesome. Right on. Let's, you can take whatever posture in worship. You can stand, sit, kneel, lie down, face down, whatever. Um, just uh, stay in your own space. We ask for the whole um, distancing measures. But we're here to worship the Lord. And when we corporately begin and join our voices, there's no social distancing with the chords of, of music, the sound that comes together, which is the praise and worship, which is exalts the Lord. And he inhabits the praise of his people. So when we bless the Lord, guess what? He blesses us. He comes into this place. So we're going to get a, a little bit moving this morning right off the bat. And we're going to declare the goodness of God. So you, like I said, I was just going to tell you to stand, but I just told you to stand, do whatever you want. So let's invite the Lord. God, we thank you for your great love. We thank you, Lord, that on purpose this morning, you were ready for us to join you before we even got dressed for church. Uh, as our eyes open, you say, good morning, child. I'm so excited to have you step into my presence corporately to exalt, to give me praise and worship, that I can come and meet with you. Lord, we just invite your presence right now, even to just uh, calm every fear, to lift every burden, and to help us focus our eyes and attention on you, the lover of our souls, in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen, amen. 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 good and your mercy endure it forever Lord you are good and your mercy endure it forever people from every nation and tongue from generation to generation we worship you hallelujah hallelujah good and your mercy endure it forever people from every people from every nation and tongue from generation to generation we worship you and hallelujah hallelujah we worship you for who you good and your mercy endure it forever Lord you are good and your mercy endure it forever people from every nation and time from generation to generation we worship you hallelujah
around. You can have fun in church. Amen. <laughs> Praise you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Oh, bless your name, Lord. Mm.
Thank you, Jesus. just on Sunday, not just in church. Every time we open our eyes and we draw a new breath and recognize that it's the gift of God, that in you we live and move and have our being. What a Savior. You do all things well. If it hadn't been for Jesus, we'd be dead in our sins. We'd be lost. We'd be in darkness. We'd have no hope at all. Jesus knew that. When he faced the cross and as a perfect person had the choice, he chose that kind of death on a cross for you and for me. He chose to be a sacrifice in a way that we couldn't be in our imperfectness. He alone could wash away our sins. He alone could sit at the right hand of the Father, ever living to intercede for us. He alone could be the promise of return where he comes for his church and we will be with him. And he'll establish a new heaven and a new earth. Thank you, Jesus. And the days are coming. The days are here. Where things in prophecy are taking place and being fulfilled. To know that scripture is true and that the time is short. But he loves his bride. He loves the church. And it's his heart's desire that every one of us, our family members, our friends, that we would would remind them that Jesus is the lover of their souls. And they would simply say, yes, 
Yes, be my Savior. Yes, forgive my sins. Yes, offer me eternal life. Yes, I want you to be the Lord of my life. Even as I take time to work on what that looks like, your Holy Spirit can shape me and mold me and help me become who I need to be. But I say yes to you, Jesus. Yes to what you did for me. I accept that. It's a free gift. It's that simple. And I pray for those. I think of my brother. I think of my, my family members that don't know you, that are choosing to, to do their own thing, to do it their own way. God, reach out and shower them with your love and peace, even now by your Holy Spirit. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Your mercy never fails me in all my days. I've been held in your hands from the moment I awake up till I lay my head. I will see of the goodness of God. Sing out loud. never fails me in all my days I've been held in your hands from the moment I wake up till I lay my head I will see the goodness of God in all my
Jesus is running after, is running after me. With my life laid down, I'm surrendered now. I give you everything. Your goodness is running after, is running after me. and just testify this morning in your spirit to the times that God has been faithful for you, has come through when you didn't know what else to do, has directed you, has guided you, has protected you, has loved on you. Think back in your spirit this morning as we just sing that chorus again, all the times that God has been faithful to you and just worship him and thank him this morning. Thank you, Jesus. Your goodness is running after Jesus. Running after me, yes, Lord. Your goodness is running Jesus. after, is running after me. Okay. Life laid down, I'm surrendered now. I give you everything. Your goodness is running after, is running after me. my life you have been faithful. Thank you, Jesus. And all my life you have been so, so good. Every breath that I am able, I will see of the goodness of God. I will sing of the goodness for preparing us. Thank you, God, for drawing us thank together. You, thank you, Holy Spirit, for moving in this place. There's a weightiness. I thank you for the power of your peace and love. Thank you, God, for revelation. We pray for those who lack faith to ask for it. We ask for faith today. As you speak into our hearts from your word, God, we trust you. You're going to continue to shape us and mold us. You're going to continue to hold us. And you come after us, Lord. It sounds like it's God on our terms, but no, this is, these are your terms, that you come after us. Holy Spirit, you pursue us. You, you long for that interaction from us, Lord, as we open yes. our word for devotions, as we sing a worship song, as we bow our heads and pray to you, as we pray for somebody else, as we minister. God, you're, you're coming after us to, to help us step into that place, to shape us and mold us, because we couldn't do it in our own strength. Thank you, Jesus. But I thank you, God, for your goodness, for your righteousness covers us today. Thank you, Lord, for what you do in each and every one of us. Thank you for what you're willing to do, not only in this church, but in this entire city, God. Yes, Lord. Enlarge our faith. Give us spiritual eyes to see what you could do, Thank you, Jesus. what you're going to do. Make us a part of it, we ask in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, 
Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Well, we want to welcome you to City Christian Center, um, and we also want to welcome those who are live streaming from our website. We're glad you're joining us. We know there's lots of reasons why you might not be able to physically be here in the place, but this is awesome. This is almost a full house for our 30% capacity, and so, you know, we, even with our restrictions, I, I pretty much just call this revival. Why don't we just do that? <laughs> I mean, why don't we just claim the revival's coming? Wouldn't that be a good idea? Right? Awesome. You know, I think for God to move now with all these circumstances that seem like they're set up against the corporate body coming together, I think that's just like God to say, you know what, I'm going to move now. Now that everyone says, oh, watch out and stay back and everything else, and we are following social distancing. We're keeping to our mandated numbers. We are hand sanitizing as you come in. We've got the flow and all that. I'm only removing my mask because the KFLNA allows a speaker, a preacher, worship leader to remove their mask during service. As soon as I'm off this platform, I wear the thing again. Here's the thing. The, whole, the, the mask might stop respiratory droplets. The jury's still out on that. But it cannot stop a move of the Holy Spirit, right? And so you put a mask on, make me wear a hood, a, a suit, whatever, you know, dress shoes, non-dress shoes. You know, a pastor once said early in my ministry, a senior pastor of mine said something really important about uh, wearing certain things at church because, well, listen, I started in the 90s, so <clears throat> that's a little while ago. But dress code was a thing, right? And you just, you can't go to church wearing that. Why not? Well, because you can't. Why not? The, the idea of dressing up actually comes from wanting to honor God, but it also kind of got all confuddled and became a, this religious spiritual thing where if you weren't wearing the right suit, or down south, ladies, if you've ever seen church, you have to have a hat at least this big, right? The person sitting behind you can't even see the pastor because you've got a church hat on. Woo! And it becomes more about, and this, this pastor said to me, you know, it was a very large church, and he said, Steve, if you wore an Armani suit, people would look at you and go, wow, look at Steve and that Armani suit. And they'd be all about, wow, look at that suit and how much it costs, blah, blah, blah. He said, on the other hand, if you wore holy jeans and a ratty old T-shirt and your hair was messed up, and that's why I cut it so short, so it's always looking not messed up. You know, if you had holes in your shoes or whatever, you were filthy, dirty, unshaven, people would look at you and go, wow, he's disrespectful. He's just total, a total mess. And again, they'd be looking at Steve again. And, and he said, I want them to look at us. He was a preacher. I was the worship leader. He said, I want them to look at us on the platform and see right on past us and look into the eyes of God and hear the words of heaven and make sure their focus is on Jesus Christ, right? So mask or no mask, as I get older, glasses or no glasses, you know, whatever else I'm wearing, just see right past me and look at what the Lord is doing. Look at what God is saying, and that should be our focus, right? That's what I'm talking about. So yeah, I'm, I mean, I still wear a dress shirt and, and jeans, but nice jeans. And, you know, I even wore a golf shirt a couple times this summer. I'm just getting footloose and fancy free. God is no respecter of that kind of stuff. I would hate for someone to come in off the street, look around and go, oh, I don't belong here. Right? God forbid that we would ever stand in the way of someone feeling like they could be welcome in church. Right? Anyway, that's not even my message. Just I uh, want to thank you guys for being here. Thank you for being online. We are working... Uh, tirelessly at least a few of us are working tirelessly and I'm not speaking even of myself but we are working on new camera new lens new everything so that we can get better at that because we as we said we have reached out and touched places like uh, Mexico Cuba Honduras uh, um, the east coast the west coast and, and and over in Europe and so man I'm just like okay Lord if you want to use this to reach out beyond our our local uh, location that you know I'm good with that let's let God do what God will do right but we're so thankful that you've tuned in you're so, so thankful you're here you have the courage to show up and say I'm, I'm worshiping God anyways and so we're going to continue to worship God we, we uh, want you to know we've been working hard on getting calendars ready for the women's ministry the men's ministry we're looking at what to do with youth because even if we're social distancing you can't pass a ball back and forth because like oh you touched it so we're, we're figuring out what to do, but we have not forgotten you young people. We're working on that. We're trying to reconnect with our young adults again now that things are back to school and everything. And uh, lots of people are changing roles and all that kind of stuff. It, I have to say, uh, a little bit sad because a few months back now, uh, almost a year ago now, we, uh, we had this 
beautiful family that was a part of us for so long, and, and they had to move because of a job, and so we miss the Pauls greatly. But Chiqui is here today, and this is her last Sunday. And uh, she has, uh, uh, she's still a daughter in the house, right? We love her. But she has gotten into her dream school. She's going to Waterloo, and she's going to do something pharmaceutical, and I don't even understand it, but this is something she's, she felt like God had put on her heart and that God was drawing her to, and it finally came true. And so we're going to love you from a distance. But, you know, we have services on live stream, right? So <laughs> we love you and we'll miss you, but we just speak blessing over you. That school will go awesome. It'll be great to be back with your parents again and maybe your brothers too a little bit, right? And uh, so just for your future. And we speak into every future of the young people who are trying to figure out what to do next. So God bless you, my friend. We love you. I uh, w- want to let you know that we are not business as usual, but we're trying to start up all of our ministries, even if it has to look a little differently. We're stepping in this September to everything. And, and no matter what it looks like, we're committed to making sure that's happening. We had a men's gathering out in the parking lot with chairs and coffee, and uh, we're, we're looking at how to, how to do this effectively. So I want you to know that that's happening. Please pray for us so that we have creativity and, and wisdom uh, joined together. I want to thank you for your giving. Uh, we, instead of passing a plate today, we do have a box at the back on your way out. So we just invite you to drop your envelopes into that box. That way there's no passing of plates and that sort of thing. And also online, I think you've heard this if you've tuned in ever before, same thing. Uh, you can mail your tithe in. There's a black mailbox at the front here. I check every day. Uh, or, or you can also give through Canada Helps. Where there's a, a link on our line online as well so that you can do that. And we're so thankful. We know everyone's circumstances are different, but we thank God for the faithfulness in this house. Our missions budget is on point. And I'll tell you, coming through the Sunday, right, And It's good, right? God has been so faithful. I'll tell you, being in ministry, every, every summer you go, okay, how's this going to go, right? We're a little behind, and we think, oh, do we just shoot too high this time or whatever, you know, trying to be wise and faithful at the same time. And you know what? This summer, I think, is we're probably in the best position, missions-wise, in the summer that we've ever been. So again, man wants to do something, the devil wants to mess up, and look at this. We're just, it's coming in. So thank God. He's good, right? God is good. That's right. Praise God. He's moving and shaking. I'll give you an update on all the different uh, ministers later, uh, Village of Hope and, and in Thailand, the people we support. Right now, Reapers in the Rain is doing their leadership retreat online at Mount Zion. And so they have guest speakers throughout this week, and they're wrapping up right now as we speak. But uh, Chuck has continued to, to determine to minister however he can as well. So thank you for that. Today I am talking about sharing hope. And I hope to, to shed some light on a little bit of perspective because for the scripture out of the Psalms in chapter 31, just two verses, 23 and 24. It says, O oh, love the Lord, all you his godly ones. The Lord preserves the faithful and fully I'm trying to find hope wherever it was and pull it into the message. You know, there's 13 references to hope in the book of Job alone. And if a guy had ever faced adversity, it's a guy like Job, and yet words of hope kept being sown throughout that message, that book. So I want you to be aware. Today I'm talking about sharing hope, and I'm going to refer to sowing and bestowing. Sowing and bestowing. So there's one where you're putting it in there, another one where you're just laying it out there. I think we need to do it all. Beyond having hope, we're called to give hope. Uh, there's actually a cool video about the Billy Graham Association with their, um, their chaplains that are doing crisis chaplaincy. And uh, it's about a half an hour long, so don't go on your phones now because I'll know eventually who's got their head up. And down. No. Uh, it's really intriguing about uh, uh, COVID, about police disasters, about natural disasters, about all these things where they have actually responded and have given out hope. And there is a link here, but if you just um, look up Billy Graham Association crisis uh, chaplains, a half an hour special, and uh, it's, it's worth the 28 and a half minutes. It, yeah, it's helpful. Recently, I spoke on always being ready to give a reason for the hope that's in us. That's in 1 Peter 3, 8 to 15. You have a hope because Jesus Christ has saved our souls, right? So whether we get struck by lightning right now or not, if we know Jesus, if we're in Christ, our hope is in heaven. 
To be absent from this body is to be present with the Lord. So we know that we can have that kind of hope. But always give a reason. Why are you so hopeful? Well, let me tell you. His name is Jesus, right? The point was for all of us to have hope and also to testify about it. Tell people you've got hope. You know, sometimes I have to say that in faith. I get a little worried or weighed down, and I have to say, no, wait a second, because my God says. And I'll tell you, you say these things out loud. You start to talk about who God is. If God is for us, who can be against us, right? And greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. You could say, oh, I know that. I've heard that. Right. But my challenge is say it. Say it. Right? Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. So you say it to yourself, all of a sudden, you're, you know what? You're already testifying. But you're just testifying to yourself. Your spirit is hearing what you're actually saying. It sounds a little strange, but I'll tell you what. You try it and see if it doesn't give you some perspective. It says, the word of God will not return void. So you declare the word like that. You say it and watch what the Holy Spirit does. All of a sudden in your heart, you're like, yeah, that's right. He is in me. What am I afraid of? What am I worried about? Why am I... But sometimes you've got to talk yourself off the ledge a little bit. You see the world. You see what's going on. You think, oh, man, this is nuts, right? And, and then you've got to say, no, but wait a second. So God says I am. This is where I am supernaturally. And all of a sudden, your, sh- your faith shifts. It's incredible. That's what we need to do. So my heart is heavy for the well-being of our next generation. I'm calling for help from the body of Christ to be faithful, administering hope to this next generation. We need to offer hope hope. There's so many what ifs. What if I I can't finish school? What if I catch COVID when I go to school? What if the point of what is the point of finishing school? What if the career I'm trying to for changes because of the present circumstances? What if I get sick? What if I have to quarantine forever now? What if I will never be able to financially be independent? What if I can't meet a Christian to be in a long-term relationship with? What if I can't find meaningful Christian relationships to grow in my faith? What if I can't find enough people around me to be the church in the future? And all those questions can come in all at one time and they go, they either feel down, heavy, depressed, or they think, what's the point? And some of us are not in that place. Some of us are like, you know, I get the point. I've seen over the decades of how God's been faithful and I haven't dealt with COVID. I haven't dealt with some of the stuff we're dealing with right now, but I've been through some stuff. Anybody been through some stuff? And the rest of you are probably lying, but uh, we... (laughs) We've been through some stuff, and if you know Jesus Christ, you have watched how He has remained with you, right? In times when you were dealing with your own stuff, and and even if it was someone else's stuff, it affected you. Well, my parents split up when I was nine years old. That affected them. It was rough on them. But also, I had to deal with my own stuff in that situation, and God has been faithful. Uh, other struggles we've come up against, uh, the loss of a job, having to change locations where you live, having where you live be falling apart. Can I get amen? <laughs> or, or your car. I love cars, and I hate cars because you get a car just working right, and then you go somewhere far away, and guess what happens to your car? You've got to call Mike. It's just, so it's <laughs> just stuff happens, and I have seen the goodness of God. Through all those times, I've seen God help us get to where we need to go. So I can look back and say, I've been uh, over some things, and I've seen God carry me over those things. This younger generation has not seen that. They've seen the wall. They've seen the struggle, but they haven't seen the ability to step to the other side. And that's a challenge that we need to face and we need to work on. So what ifs, what ifs, what ifs. In Matthew 6, right after the Beatitudes, we learn about not worrying. He says, who can add a single day to their life by worrying? It's clear. You can't, but you need to trust in the Lord. And it's probably never been more difficult in my lifetime to not worry. And for the next generation, how much more? So sowing and bestowing hope. Those who have it need to give it. I'm not saying if you'd like to share some hope. I'm telling you, as strong as I can, share hope. Sow hope. Give hope away. Because you know what it's like to have it. Maybe you don't remember what it's like to not have it. Abraham with Isaac. You know this story? Abraham and God have, have stepped into covenant, and God says, you know what, I just need to make sure Abraham is fully committed to me. And he says, I'm going to test you. And I'm not sure if Abraham thought about what kind of test. He's like, okay, I, I think I'm ready for this. Here we go. He's like, yeah, I want you to take your son, your only son whom you love, 
and I want you to take him up the mountain, lay him on the altar, and you're going to sacrifice him to me. To show me that you're committed. And I'll tell you, knowing the character of God, I'm thinking, what on earth has happened? And this is only the first book of the Bible. Like everything was going fine with creation. He made it. He saw it was good. And, and now we're at Abraham here. And this seems like an, it's just a terrible question to even ask. Abraham took the wood, the burnt offering, and laid it. Oh, let me back up a bit. Sorry, it's in Genesis 22. And instead of reading the whole chunk, because I want to go some other places too. He walks with him. And he gets to the point at the foot of the mountain, and he, he talks to his, his young men who are helping him. He says, stay here with the donkey, and I and the lad will go over there and will worship and re- then return to you. Abraham took the wood and the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac, his son, and he took it in his hand, the fire and the knife. So the two of them walked on together. And here's where we realize we don't know how old Isaac was, but he's old enough to get it, right? He's like, Father, I see the wood. I see the fire. I realize you're carrying that sharp knife there, but where is the sacrifice? And Abraham's going, God's asked me to sacrifice my only beloved son. And this obviously is a foreshadowing of what Father God does with Jesus Christ for each and every one of us, but it seems so messed up. Behold the fire, the wood, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham said, God will provide for himself the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. So the two of them walked on together. Even that phrase, so the two of them walked on together. I'm sure Isaac had no clue what was going on, but there's a point where he says, he, he s- assembled the wood and laid Isaac on the altar. And he took the knife and he raised it to slay his son. And that's when God said, hold on a second. Don't lay a finger on the boy. He got to that point in his head where he's like, God, you asked me, I'm committed to you so much that I'm putting you first beyond all of my relationships, including my own family, and he's ready to do this. And he goes, stop. And then there's a ram in the thicket. He pulls him out and he sacrifices the ram. It ends well, but hope from Abraham gave Isaac hope in his crazy circumstances. Isaac's like, I don't know what's going on here, much like this generation. I don't know what's going on here. But it is messed up. I've never faced this anymore. I've never seen anywhere else where a father has laid his son on an altar, tied him up and said, here we go. Right? And Isaac, I mean, it doesn't say they wrestled. It didn't say he put him in an arm bar or choke hold and you know, forced him. Isaac's like, I trust you, Dad. What? <laughs> yeah? It, it was incredible. And so I'm thinking from the perspective of Isaac, his circumstances are just crazy. But Abraham sowed hope into Isaac's situation. God will provide, son. God will provide. And I really like to ask Isaac what was going through his mind at that moment. You know, God is never early. He's never late. He's always right on time. And I'm sure Isaac's going, you know, a couple minutes sooner God might have been good because <laughs> I was a little nervous Dad was going to do the deed, right? Right? But Abraham understood. He put God first no matter what. But he also trusted God. You see, Isaac was something that God promised him in the first place. He was too old to have kids. Sarah was too old to have kids. It wasn't going to happen. And then the angel of the Lord came and said, Listen, I've spoken over you that from you there will be you know, descendants as numerous as the sands on the shore, the stars in the sky. And then God says, Kill your one and only son. And Abraham trusted this God. And God, of course, in his nature, delivered Abraham, his son Isaac, and provided a sacrifice. But I needed to pray for, at that moment, I would want to say, Isaac, listen, buddy, I am praying for you. But I know God's still on the throne, and I know this is messed up. I don't have all the answers. Abraham didn't have the answer. He didn't say, listen, offer up your son, but don't worry, I'm going to send a sacrifice at the last second. He didn't know. Because Abraham, God actually speaks to Abraham, and he says, Now I know that you have enough fear of God that you wouldn't even withhold your son, your one and only son, from me. And from that point on, it was called the Mount of the Lord. It will be provided. And that's what God did. Let's go to Moses with Israel for a second in Exodus 17. I mentioned this story not too long ago where they're...
Israelite army was winning. And when he got tired and all the blood had drained from his hands and everything, he finally, then, then the Amalekites would start winning. And this went back and forth until finally they recognized what was going on. And Ben and her got a rock so he could sit on. Uh, her and Aaron, sorry, came to either side and held up his hands. I don't know if you remember what it was like in school to raise your hand and the teacher's not answering you. And you're waiting and you're waiting and finally you're doing one of these on the table. like, Hello, teacher. And your arm is just getting, you know, you have to switch hands because all the blood. That's what was going on with Moses. But the, the beauty of it is down in the valley, Joshua's trying to lead this army. And he's watching them move forward and move back. And he's seeing some of his soldiers fall. And he's trying to overcome to take this valley that God had promised them. And he's fighting and fighting. And, and, and what's his boss doing? What's Moses doing? Sitting under a tree on the hill, having a nice cap, you know. Like, Moses, come on, what's going on? Moses, in the, in, in the interim, he's actually doing what's called interceding. So spiritually, he's standing in the gap, not only for young Joshua, who he's been pouring into, but for his whole people, the whole army. And by raising his hands and saying, okay, God, we, we worship you, we honor you, we expect you to fulfill your promise. We're going to exalt you. We're going to pray through that you will deliver this valley into the hands of Israelites and remove the Amalekites. And, and he's doing this in prayer. And at the end, God says, this is important. Make, uh, build an altar of stone so that everyone remembers this place where when someone interceded, God sowed in and the victory was theirs. Sorry, I'm not supposed to get emotional, am I? Uh, they're in the fight of their life. And this person who is interceding for them is standing in the gap so that they can get through to what they need to do. And it was a life and death situation. Have you ever been in one of those? And it took having faith that God was going to come through and the hope for Joshua to finally get that every time Moses' hands were lifted, that this battle was being won. Could you imagine at some point in the battle where he's hacking away and fighting, and he looks up and goes, Moses isn't just chilling out in the shade. His prayers, his words are making the difference in this physical battle. These supernatural prayers, this intercession is making a difference in physical circumstances that are overcoming life and death. So imagine Joshua's perspective and the people's perspective. Every time Moses was there, he'd be like, yeah! Until the battle was won. So the perspective of Isaac, he needed Abraham to sow in hope. The perspective of Joshua and the people seeing Moses giving his supernatural energy, or praying into what was physically going on. Let's go to 1 Samuel 14 and talk about Jonathan and the armor bearer. I love this. I love the armor bearer. And Jonathan is armor bearer out there, and he's young and full of adventure, and he's just like, hey, man, let's go start some trouble. Like, like no teen ever said ever, right? Let's go get into this. Let's go see what we can do. Let's have some fun. He's like, we're going to go up to the Philistines. We're going to climb up through the rocks. And if, if they come to us, we're going to run away. But if they call us up, we're going to take that as a sign that God has delivered them into our hands. He says, because what, what problem is it for God to deliver, whether it's by few or by many? So the two of us can take on the army with God, or the whole army can take on the army with God. See, Jonathan understood something really important. See, either way... This is a God thing. And so this is what he says in 1 Samuel 14, in verse 6. Then Jonathan said to the young man who was carrying his armor, Come and let us cross over to the garrison of these uncircumcised fellows. Perhaps the Lord will work with us, for us. For the Lord is not restrained to save by many or by few. His armor bearer said to him, Do all that's in your heart. Turn yourself, and here I am with you according to your desire. And the NIV, it says... I am with you, heart and soul. You want to take the two of us and set us up against an entire army? Woo, let's go. Come on. I'm like, as, as an employee, I might be thinking, I'm going to call my union first because I don't like the way this looks. I'm thinking, yeah, us two against all of them. I mean, I'm a pretty good fighter. He's a pretty good fighter. But against, you know, hundreds or thousands of people, maybe not such a good idea. Of course, what happens is he does rise up and the Lord does move and there is an incredible victory at that moment. 
But what I love about it is this armor bearer, Jonathan had a relationship with his armor bearer. We don't even know his name. We don't know what kind of interactions they have except for this one moment where you've got to recognize the kind of faith and trust that this armor bearer had in Jonathan. Maybe he had the fear of his job. I just better be obedient or I'm going to run into trouble. But I think it's something different because he could have just said, well, whatever you say, I'll do it too. Yeah, I guess it's my job. He's like, whatever you do, heart and soul, I am, you go this way, I'm coming with you. Let's do this. That's not, that's my own paraphrase. He said, the Bible according to Stephen, let's do this. He, he, obviously, Jonathan had sowed enough hope in him, enough encouragement, enough faith. He had to have a spirituality to recognize that this battle was not going to be physical, but, but supernatural. They're going to step out and draw their swords and they'll do their thing. But unless the Holy Spirit moves, these two were dead. And Jonathan and his armor bearer had faith. But the faith enough to say, Jonathan, whatever you want to do, I am completely with you. That's a blessing. That's an honor to have that kind of relationship with somebody. And I want us to get to the point where we're so sowing into generations uh, that are coming before us. And I say generations because the older I get, you know, they say what generation X and Y and Z and millennial and post-millennial and extra-millennial and whatever millennial there is. Like, they just keep adding names and stuff. But the older I get, the more of those letters and numbers are, are underneath me. So I want us to get to a point where we're sowing into those people, not that they follow us blindly, but that they have a faith in what we have a faith in. I'm not just saying, oh, just believe in Pastor Steve. Trust me, in my humanity, I will probably let you down. It's not in my heart to do that, but I am a human being. But I'm telling you that when I point to Jesus, like Paul says, follow my example as I follow Christ. As I have faith, you have faith too. If we can go against the army, if God's going before us and calling us into this, then let's step into this. If there's crazy to be had, but it's God crazy, then let's get crazy. If God's saying do this, then let's go do it. Let's believe for it. And I'll tell you, if they haven't believed for something like that yet, and you haven't either, who do you think is going to be the first to go? Who's, who's going to step in? When Jesus rode in Jerusalem, it said, the, the Sadducees first, he said, hey, silence these children. It was the children singing Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest, right? They were worshiping Messiah. And the Pharisees like, hey, hey, they're not supposed to do that. Hold on. Jesus says, if they don't, even the rocks are going to cry out. It was the faith of a child, right? And I love the simple faith of young people. But also, they need to know what to have faith in. And we have got to sow and bestow faith on the next generations. And by the way, if you're a senior, then there's probably a bunch of generations. But I'll tell you what. If you are um, in a teenager, then you can sow into the preteen generation. If you're a young adult, you can sow into the high school generation. If you're a young married person, you, can, you know how it goes, right? Pour in, sow in, share hope. And if you're not feeling hopeful, pray for it. As a mature believer, you don't have it, guess what? You know Jesus. Talk to Him. Declare His Word. And watch faith arise. Watch hope get birthed in your spirit again. And when you have it, give it to somebody else. Think of the perspective of Isaac. What is going on? Abraham says, trust God. The perspective of Joshua on the people. Someone is praying for me. Someone's interceding for me. The perspective of the armor bearer. I know Jonathan isn't doing this because he's big-headed. I know that he's trying to honor God, follow God. And so I'm going to follow him following God. How about Jesus and the man with the demon-possessed son in Mark 9? Thing And Jesus says, uh, excuse me, if... Say what now? I don't know the Hebrew for that, but you say what now? You said if? <laughs> 21, Jesus asked the boy's father, how long has he been like this? From childhood, he answered. It's often thrown him into the fire or the water to kill him. But if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. Verse 23, if you can, Jesus said, everything is possible for one who believes. Immediately, the boy's father explained, I do believe. Help me overcome my unbelief. I get it here, but I wrestle with it here. I get it here. I want to, but too many natural circumstances have gotten in my way. I want to believe for my boy, but I've seen 
what these demons have done to him, where they've led him, what they've tried to do to destroy his life. And now you're saying, oh, it's all going to be fine. That's what I want, <laughs> but i got to believe that that's what can happen. He says, believe. When Jesus saw that the crowd was running to the scene, he rebuked the impure spirit. He said, you deaf and mute spirit. He said, I command you to come out of him and never enter him again. A little spiritual warfare. First of all, we do it in Jesus' name. That's where our authority is. And we say, get out in Jesus' name and do not enter him again. There's scripture about cleaning the house but leaving it empty. And that's a whole other message. But the, the goal is not to let, let someone get spiritually delivered and then leave them empty. You, you cast the demon out. You invite Jesus in. You say, in faith, get lost. The demon has to respond. And then you help them step into a spirituality where Jesus Christ is their Savior and Lord too. You may have a question about demonic stuff. Is it real? Is it? I'm telling you what, there are stories. And we're not about exalting Satan or the devil, but seen and heard and encountered way too many things that are just crazy. I've also seen God deliver a lot of people into freedom. It's good. So for the perspective of this young father, from the maker of all mankind, because it says Jesus was there in the beginning, right? Let us make man in our image. So he was there. So the father of humanity talking to this young father, at least young in terms of Jesus being the Alpha and Omega. You follow me? This young father going, I love my son so much. I've seen so much hardship for this young man. And I, I want to believe that, God, you're just going to make it all better. But in my heart, I've grieved over the, the hardship of what that, that young person walked through. And Jesus says, believe. And this young father says, I want to believe. Help me on belief. And then, boom, he sees a miracle take place. And God delivers and Paul exhorts Timothy, this is my last one. In verse 2, it says, To Timothy, my dear son, grace and mercy and peace from God the Father and Jesus Christ our Lord. Thanks, And then the title is Thanksgiving. I thank God whom I serve as my ancestors did, with a clear conscience, as night and day I constantly remember you in my prayers. Recalling your tears, I long to see you, so that I may be filled with joy. I am reminded of your sincere faith, which first lived in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded now lives in you also. Appeal for loyalty to Paul and the gospel in verse 6. For this reason I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For the Spirit of God gave us does not make us timid, but gives us power and love and self-discipline. Now think of it from the perspective of Timothy. I call you my son, my daughter. I bless you with grace and mercy and peace from God, from my heart to yours. I thank God for you. You know, young people need to know that there's someone out there who thanks God for them. I thank God that you're on this planet. I thank God for your gifts. I thank God for your personality. I thank God for who you are becoming. I'm watching you grow up and mature and, and in and the Lord as well. I'm seeing that happen. And I bless you. I'm, I'm excited to be a part of that journey. I thank God for you. I remember you in my prayers. I pray for you. Not just your own children, all children. I pray for you. I long to see you. Thanks, Dad. Bye. Where are you going now? I don't know. See you in a couple days. <laughs> no, I long to see you. I am impacted by your faith. I've seen your faith. I've seen your family and how faith has been passed down. I've seen faith in you. I believe it's the same kind of faith. Oh, Lord. And when they get going, right, just, wow, let's get Grandma to pray because then the whole mountain's shaking. Earth trembles when Grandma's praying, right? And Paul says, Paul says, Timothy, I've seen you, son. I've seen the Spirit of God working on you. And I've seen the Holy Spirit come out of your mouth with some of the things you're saying. I've seen you step in and try and do ministry, trying to encourage somebody else, reach out and offer them hope. I've seen that in you. 
like your grandma. I've seen that, that the faith that's come through your family is now in you. And I'll tell you, some of us don't have that spiritual heritage. That's okay. Whenever you come to Christ, you have an opportunity for Him to be your Heavenly Father and to speak into your situation. And you could still have that faith that burns and comes out and, and the anointing. People can recognize anointing. You can't see the Spirit, but you can see the effects of the Holy Spirit. It's like the wind. You can't see the wind, but man, those trees, boom. The wind's powerful. The Holy Spirit is more powerful. I call you my son, my daughter. I bless you. I thank God for you. I remember you in my prayers. I long to see you. I'm impacted by your faith. Even in all these ridiculous surroundings, even though you're wondering about your future, God is incredible and He has something for you. It's something that's full of power. It's something that's full of love. And it's something that's full of self-discipline. That's God. It's the Spirit of God that's going to give you that power. It's going to give you that love. It's going to give you self-discipline. Romans 15, 13 says, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in Him so that you may overflow you want to know how you sow and bestow? You need to overflow. There's the third one. You're waiting, right? Pastors and their alliterations, right? If you have hope and you're, you're going to bestow and sow, that means that you've got to be so filled with hope yourself that you are overflowing. And you know what God does, right, in us? He pours in. And how does He pour in? Press down, shaking together, and running over. That's the overflow. And when we're talking about hope, it's synonymous with the idea of faith and faith in God particularly, but also faith in these young people in their future. Yes, God is still on the throne, and He's not leaving until He comes back to get His own. In the meantime, we overflow. So if you've been a Christian for more than a minute, and that can literally mean 60 seconds or what all you other people say, oh, it's been a minute. I don't even know how long that is. Whatever. It's been a minute. If you have been, if you've known Jesus Christ for any length of time, then your job is to share the hope that is in you. And if you don't have hope today, we're going to pray for you so that by the time you leave this place, you've got some faith that God's about to do some sowing into your spirit and that you have a little bit of faith going on. I'll tell you, there are people in this room that will pray for you. And, and you whether you even think you have it or not, if you know Jesus Christ, you can pray for hope for other people. Do you know that Paul prayed for healing for people even though he had a thorn in his flesh? The Scripture isn't clear about what that thorn was. Some people say, well, I'm not even going to get into it. There's so many different things people have thought that the thorn in the flesh was. And yet Paul administered healing through the Holy Spirit to people. So you can have hope and sow it and bestow it. Or you can not have hope and pray for someone else to have it. At the same time, they're going to be praying for you. And the Holy Spirit will be faithful, and He can birth hope in you this morning. Let's pass on the words of Jonathan to the armor bearer, to the next generation. Let's go and see what God will do. Let's go and see what God will do. Who knows what He might be up to. You might be this close. who are so hungry to see something real and supernatural and eternal. They'll be so hungry, they'll say, you know, wherever you're going, that supernatural things are going to take place, that's where I'm going to be. And we've tried to, to tell people, what you really need to do is come to church because we're taking attendance. You need to show up and be at church, right? Being at church doesn't make you a Christian any more than going to a garage makes you a car. But coming to a place where you're worshiping together, coming to a place where people can pray for each other, coming to a place where you hear the Word of God wash over you, that's an opportunity for you to grow in hope. And that's where you can get it and give it. So let's pass on that word to the armor bearer, to the next generation, to our kids, to other young people. They don't have to be 
They only have to be younger than you. I think they could be your peers too. You know that? I think there are times when even young people have ministered to older people. People have shared faith that were younger and they spoke and, and as an older person went, you know what? I should have known that. <laughs> or I've heard that in church, but this kid's living it, man. And I'll tell you, the Lord has sometimes given me a spiritual kick in the butt because I've seen a young person go, yeah, you know what? This, I just believe this. Boom. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, I know. <laughs> I'm supposed to be there too. And, and when, it's, when it gets spoken over me, I'm like, you know what? They're right. And then that, that fixes my stinking thinking. It gets me out of the natural and gets me thinking supernatural again. It gets me, instead of thinking about the newsreels, it gets me thinking about Scripture. And I'm going, yeah, no, he's right. She's right. So maybe we all share together. Hey, come with us. Believe with us. Let's see what the Lord might do. Because we believe he can do anything. That's the last thought this morning. Can he do anything? Is God God? Is God a God of His Word. Is His Word true? Is there power in His Word? Is He still performing miracles today? Well, if you're asking me, uh-huh. If, if God has stopped doing what the Word of God says He does, then we should all go do something else. But, and I like this but, if God is a God still today, the same yesterday, today, and forever, still passing out hope, still uh, sowing faith into people, still moving in supernatural ways, then why don't we ask for God to do supernatural things? And we need to show our other people that we're asking in faith. You might look foolish. You might step out on a limb. You might look out and go, I'm believing for this, and everyone's going, yeah, okay. But you stand there and do what God's asked you to do, and He will bless you, and other people will go, man, I don't know about all their ideas, but I know where their faith is. I know where their heart is. I need a faith like that one. So that's what we're going to do. I'm going to invite the worship team up, and let's take a moment and pray. Bow your heads, close your eyes. I don't know what you came in here like this morning. Um... I don't know if you were happy or sad, scared or angry, frustrated, fearful, or full of joy and ready to take on the world. Regardless of where you were there, it's important that when you walk out of this place today, I want you to believe that God is doing something in your spirit and in your circumstances. Do you believe that with me, church? So those of us who are in process right now, who would just say, you know, God, I'm, I'm like that, that father of the demon-possessed boy. I've been through stuff, and you asked me to believe, and I want to believe, but also I believe, but help me with my unbelief. And if this morning you could just say, yeah, you know, Pastor, I'm still working through something. If people in this room have hope, I'd sure like some of that. You don't have to tell us what it is, but if you just raise your hand right now and just say, yeah, I want prayer for hope this morning, you just ask God. Yeah, thank you. Yep. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yep. Uh, yeah, but let me pray first, okay, Shirley? Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Heavenly Father, I praise you and thank you that you're here today. I thank you, Lord, for your scriptures that speak to our hearts. God, our circumstances speak to us every day, sometimes every hour, sometimes every minute, and they can be heavy. They can be fearful or they can be frustrating. And in that place of anger or fear or frustration, God, your word tells us that you offer us a spirit full of power and love and of self-discipline, of sound mind. And God, we do ask right now for you to minister to our spirits and to our mind, to our emotions and to our physical body. And God, you would minister by the power of your Holy Spirit to offer healing, restoration, and most of all, hope. And the Lord, particularly for those things that have been uh, requested with a raise of a hand, Lord, that you would give the gift of faith, the gift of hope. Together, all of us, in the name of Jesus Christ, we speak faith and hope into those circumstances right now in Jesus' name. 
Because that's what your word tells us we can do. We can agree together. We can hope for those who are looking for hope right now. And Holy Spirit, I ask you just to descend and begin to just flow right, right through them from the top of their head to the bottom of their feet for peace to begin to overwhelm them. That, Lord, you are on the throne. You are the creator of the universe. You are interested in our circumstances and can make a difference because of who you are, Jesus. And I pray that you begin to set people free from those burdens, not because everything's just going to go away and be fine, but because, God, you are with us in every storm. You're with us in every struggle, and you want to bear the burden. You want us to walk in faith. So, Lord, we just pray that our hope and our faith would increase. We pray for those who don't have it, that right now you would begin to make that deposit as we sow it in Jesus' name, that it would be filled up pressed down, shaken together, and overflowing. God, may we all give out hope this week, wherever we go, whoever we interact with, that in Jesus' name we would step out in faith on purpose and say, who knows what God might do? Who knows right now what God might do in our circumstances? But we know who God is. We know that we can trust Him and we can ask Him to do whatever according to the Scriptures, according to His name, according to how He feels about His children. We love you, Lord, and we trust that you're going to complete that work in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, amen. Shirley, you want to say something? We're going to close in worship. Right on. Amen. That's right. Thank you, Shirley. Awesome. God is good. Amen. Amen. Well, we'll invite you to take whatever posture and worship again you liked. But you've been sitting for a while. I understand it's tough to sing with a mask on. But we're going we're gonna to worship God. And I want this perspective for all of you as we walk out this door this morning. Mountains are still being What you do, we need to move. 
these words of faith in verse 1. Mountains, mountains are still being moved. sowing hope in this room right now. Pour out your faith. We need a move of your Holy Spirit. Praise you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Praise you. blessing for you this morning is to see the extraordinary in the ordinary. For you to have a little bit of faith, a little bit of hope, Mm. and pass it on with just a little word of encouragement, a little phone call, a little prayer, a little connection. Mm. It seems so simple, but the Holy Spirit moves in your words, Mm. moves in your countenance, moves by your prayers in Jesus' name. So what you say and do can create a move that God already longs to do in your circumstances and the people around you. So I bless you with the power to see the extraordinary in the ordinary as you sow and bestow hope. God bless you.